Hey everyone, I'm just trying to turn my phone on silent so it doesn't ring. Silent mode. Because a um, there'll be a student phoning. Someone will phone. Let's take that away. The professor is in. All right, sounds All right. good. <laughs> Okay, I am like so here. I'm I'm here. <laughs> Hi. What are your names? Uh, my name is Alex, and I'm Ariel. Alex and Ariel. Ariel. Hi, Alex and Ariel. Hello. Hi. Hi. It's lovely to see you. You know, I've done this about six times since 2016. Oh. So I feel like the students that helped me in tw eight years ago. You're in grade eleven, right? Which is 12, like yeah. twelve or senior year. See, oh, grade twelve. Yes. So that means that those people ha will have finished college. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Let me just put some Arctic earrings in. Yeah, yeah. No worries. No worries. And I'm going to make sure this year that I do something called a land acknowledgement, <laughs> where we think about indigenous people. So First Nations, which in the United States, you would call Indian people, but we would say First Nations, then Inuit and Métis. So I'm going to make sure I do that. I'll just do that. Um, before we start, um, we'd like to ask a couple of questions for you. Um, do we have your permission to record? Yes, okay. you have um, permission to record. I've already put a link to some of the past recordings because I've been on this a lot, right? <laughs> have you have you watched any of my old recordings or no? You not had time, I guess. Yeah, before this our Zoom call, yeah, we have in class. Oh. <laughs> For some reason, you know what? I keep giving this talk, but I but I have done different topics. I've done about why plants can't run away, poisonous <laughs> plants. I should do that next year, eh? Yeah. How to poison people you don't like. You didn't learn it from me. There you go. A lot of poisonous plants. All right, um, our next question is, um, do we have your permission to go live? Yeah, it's time. All right. Um, how do I have to share my screen? Oh. Yeah, 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 go ahead. Can I share my screen right now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. go ahead. Okay, so you'll see it, and I'm actually going to play it. How's that? Yeah, okay, great. Just, I've ended up going with the same talk because I'm so busy teaching two <laughs> courses. Okay, right, like, I know what I'm talking about. I've done this a million times before. Good, good, um, good. There we are. All right, um, how would you like to take questions? Do you want us to wait until the end, or do you want us to ask along the way? Let's 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 do it along the way and make it more interactive. So if people are, are people going to be typing questions in the question and answer box? Yeah. Yes. So just just say, "Oh, got a question incoming." <laughs> and I'll say, "Okay." And then you'll read it out to me, right? Alex and Ariel, you read me the question. Yeah, we'll read, yeah, it. We'll read it. Because sometimes people um let me get a little how's that? It just says which books are where. <laughs> Okay, does that look a little tidier in the background? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's perfectly fine. Nice. All right, well then, let's begin. All right, so good morning, everybody. Welcome back to the third week of MBTI. This is the fourth webinar of the day. It will be presented by Don Baisley, and she will be talking about the amazing Arctic plants above the tree line. And off to you, Don. Thank you very much, Ariel and Alex. And shout out to Mrs. Trimble and all the amazing teachers. And Mrs. McMullen, who has uh, run this annual event since 2014. I joined in 2016. Um, and I think I've done it about six times in that eight year period. Uh, and it's always an honor to be here and to be speaking with such 
wonderful scientists and uh, conservationists who are raising the issue of biodiversity and um, also these wonderful students. We were just chatting and I said the students who I met back in 2016, they haven't just finished college, they're like probably doing finishing their PhD. So it's amazing to think of how quickly time goes by. So I'm going to be talking about amazing Arctic plants and people and climate change um, today. And But I want to start with uh, a land acknowledgement and I don't know why it's not working. Okay, hang on a minute, let's see. Ah, here we go, it's going. Um, so in Canada, we um, are prioritizing our awareness of um, Canadian, in Canada, Indigenous peoples. So that would be our First Nations. In the United States, I think you would still call them American Indians. I'm not quite sure what is, is um, the term today. Um, also Métis people and Inuit. And uh, the Inuit are the Indigenous people of Canada who live above the tree line in Arctic regions. So I want to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from the Great Lakes. Um, this is Toronto. So I am on land um, that is the land of the Mississaugas of the Credit. And I'm in the Great Lakes region, which is um, the home to man many, many Indigenous people. And in fact, I um, am lucky enough to collaborate and work with, I have many First Nations colleagues here who, who are, are preserving biodiversity right here in Southern Ontario, sort of the southernmost part of Canada. But I'm gonna go way to the north. Um, this is a good friend and colleague, um, Maina Ishulutak, who I've worked with for many years in the Arctic. Um, not only is she um, a filmmaker who makes films about Inuit way of life. She, um, I think she's been hosting a CBC, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation um, program in the last few years. And she's also an Inuktitut, an Inuktut, that's the language, language teacher. And um, because of her, if I pronounce the words that you're gonna see better than I used to, it's thanks to um, minor. So I'm going to be taking you to the Inuit homelands. And I'm going to talk about Arctic biology and biomes. Also talk about how people use plants in the Arctic. That's probably a weird thing to think about because you think of the Arctic, you think of ice caps, you think of snow. You're like, oh, plants, really? Um, so uh, anyway, we've had my, but first my land acknowledgement. So we've had that. So it's very important for me to acknowledge and think about this because um, in terms of what has happened to the Canada's indigenous people, they've undergone many difficult things, including um, being taken away, children being taken away from parents and sent to, sent to residential schools. So there's a lot of education that is happening, that's been happening since 2015. Um, what is that? That's like uh, nine years, but nine years for everyone to really, um, who is not indigenous to reflect and think about the injustices, not long enough. So if I can get you to think about it a little bit here, that is great. I am happy. So, okay, I saw there was already a Q&A. Do you want to jump in here, Alex and Ariel? Was there a question or, or a comment? Should I look at it? Yeah, so we have a question and it's about you actually. It says, I love your earrings. Where did you get them from? Oh, thank you for the question. So these are um, um, Inuk ships, which Inuk Suite actually has two of them. They are hand carved. Um, they're about 25 or 30 years old. So these are the rocks that would be arranged to give directions in a snowy landscape for Inuit hunters when they're out on the land. These are probably made of narwhal um, ivory, which is the narwhal is like the, you know, the unicorn of the sea. It's a kind of whale, cetacean, dolphin relative. And it has this tooth that grows really long. So my husband gave these to me a long time ago. And I am very lucky to over the years have um, acquired a lot of amazing earrings. Um, and I and I know many um, Inuit jewelers who actually design and create this. So if you want to go out there and search on the internet, 
Um, there's a lot of um, um, uh, Inuit based in Alaska who are doing amazing things. What I am not wearing is my um, walrus whiskers. Earrings made of the whiskers of walrus. They're very pointy. They kind of stick me. Anyway, okay. Thank you. Was that so? There you are. These actually came. I don't know the artist who created these, but I do know the artists of uh, the jewel, the jewelers of most of what I wear today. Important to know the person that's creating. There was a second question. Quick, quickly with a second question. And then we'll <laughs> um, our second question reads: um, What percent of Arctic plants can be found elsewhere? Hold that thought. Let me go on a little bit, but that's a great question. What percentage of plants can be found outside of the Arctic? You're going to learn about that real soon. Okay, so you'll notice here that the title of this slide is Arctic and Alpine Plant Life Forms. So if you look at the left, you can see Professor Andrew Tannant Zapp 20 years ago. He's now a professor. He used to be my student and he is up a mountain in the town, the city of Tromsø in Norway. The month is July. With global warming, we're seeing less and less of this because he's on the north side of a mountain, he's on a snowpack and you don't see any trees behind him. In fact, the vegetation is like a carpet. It's like a carpet on the ground. And on the bottom right, you can see an elderly gentleman who has actually been traveling in the Arctic. He wants to see polar bears. He wants to, to, you know, experience Inuit culture. But I got him into photographing teeny tiny Arctic flowers. And he's, I think he was in his 70s and he went to the yoga class so he could stretch out to lie down to get up close and personal with the flowers. And above that, you can, you can see a very typical form of the plant, a cushion plant. It looks like a cushion. It's got flowers. This is moss camping. It's a very, very common plant in the Arctic. Um, but you will find either, well, similar species or the same species or relatives up mountains much further south. What percentage? I'm not really sure, but you'll get an idea of actually I do have a slide that speaks to that. Let's get there. So we are either very high up altitudinally at higher elevations, or we're very high up latitudinally to get to Arctic and Alpine. And in this picture, you can actually see um, a diagram or a drawing of a mountain by a man called Alexander von Humboldt. You might have heard of the Humboldt penguin or the Humboldt current. When he died in around 1850, he was like over nearly 90 or over 90. Alexander von Humboldt was the most famous scientist like in the world. Um, he trained as a mining engineer um, and he, but he really got into um, landscapes and he, because he was an engineer, he built a lot of um, instruments to measure things like temperature and stuff. And then he traveled, he was an intrepid traveler. And he went with a colleague uh, to Central and South America. And he, um, everywhere he went, he measured what he saw. So what you can see is a mountain and you can see there are really distinct um, zones of vegetation. So at the bottom of this mountain, we've got forest and you go further up and it's forest but it's like a shorter forest the trees are kind of disappearing then eventually the third level up there isn't there are no trees we are above the tree line and then at the top is the is the uh, snow capped peak so this kind of zonation um plays out on mountains especially when they're very tall like mount everest or in the rockies and uh, there could be snow all the year round if it's high enough and cold enough. Um, and if, if, it, if Star Trek was real and I could be beamed to the equator, which is zero degrees latitude, you can see this figure on the right. Um, there, there are actually two axes. There's altitude, which is the y-axis. So going up higher and then on the x-axis is latitude. And we're going from the equator 
and either to the North Pole or the South Pole. And if you could like be beamed into each of those um, different zones of latitude going higher and higher up to 90 degrees, you would find yourself in really different locations. So for the altitudinal gradient, I, uh, you can see that as you go up a mountain, you lose the trees. And that's what Alexander von Humboldt's figure is showing. It's one of his drawings. Um, you can get these um, uh, copyright free images online and you can use them there. They are um, open access. Um, they are out of copyright public domain and they're super cool to look at. Uh, so that is what like like over 200 years ago, he knew what was going on. Um, then you walk north and you see you would be at tropical rainforest in the equators. You would walk into the landscape where I am right now in the area of Toronto. I see a few trees, but it's mostly towns, cities, agriculture. We've lost a lot of our forest. Um, and that's the temperate deciduous forest. I actually am standing in the northern edge of what we call the Carolinian zone, as in the North and South Carolinas, because this is that little area of Canada where we actually get species, plant and animal species that are much more common further south. Uh, and, and their main ranges are towards the Carolinas. So we call it the Carolinian, uh, which is really temperate deciduous forest. So these trees out my window are dropping their leaves. So I have an American elm outside. Unfortunately, it died. It was finally killed by Dutch elm disease. Is there another question? Fire away. We'll get these questions done and then we'll... Yeah. So going. you previously mentioned about temperature and one of the questions says... How do plants survive in the Arctic temperatures? Is it a special evolution or something else? You're going to learn about that later in the talk. Okay. Another question? Uh, um, we'll get to that. Yeah, yeah, it's just all same. What do plants okay. survive in the Arctic? Same. Keep the faith. Keep the faith. Well, let's carry on. Let's get to the Arctic. So we're, we're, we're in Star Trek and they're beaming us into these different biomes further and further north. Then we get to um, literally this... Um, Coniferous trees, Christmas trees, which is the taiga or the boreal forest, which is around the globe through Canada, um, Alaska, Northern Europe, Russia. It's like this band of uh, conifers right around the globe. And then if you keep going north, you keep getting beamed north, you get above the tree line, you get into the tundra biome, then you get into ice caps. OK, so we're going north. This is where we are. And if you look at the annual rainfall and the annual, annual temperature, you can actually um, put all the biomes around the world, these like tundra or desert or tropical forest or a grassland savanna in Africa, um, you can put them, you can clump them together into categories depending on their average annual temperature and their average annual precipitation, which is like snow and rain. So um, if you are in, let me see if I can uh, put this down here. Okay, put, I'll put me over here. I just moved me. If you are in a hot, wet place on the planet, you're going to look around and you're going to see you are in a tropical rainforest. It's really humid and moist and there's like flowers in the trees, epiphytes and stuff like that. A lot, lot, of, lot of big trees. If you are in a coal, sorry, in a cold, dry place, you are in a desert because it's dry and it's tundra. If you're in a cold, hot place, you're in a subtropical desert like the Sahara or the Mojave Desert or the deserts in Australia or the Gobi Desert. And all of these different locations, you just need to look around and you'll know that you're in a desert or know that you're in a forest or know that you're in a boreal forest because the most common plants around you are going to be so typical of that location. So in the um in the in the tundra in the Arctic, we've got these no very few trees, if any, above there are no trees. And we'll talk about why. Um, and they're going to be these little cushion plants, and we'll talk about why they look like little pin cushions. So these are biomes and um, I'll move myself down here. This is so, sorry about this. I keep not being able to see and I am sharing. Okay, right. So a biome is a formation of plants and animals with common 
characteristics or a common vibe or a look due to similar climates. And these same biomes are found in different continents around the world because it's not about where you are uh, in terms of am I in Europe? Am I in the North and South Americas? Am I in Asia? It's about where you are in terms of the temperature and the precipitation. And that, my friends, is a Wikipedia definition. And I want to just remind all our teachers out there who, after years and years and years of me teaching students to edit Wikipedia, it's okay for your students to read Wikipedia. You cannot reference it in an assignment because it's an encyclopedia. It's you, you should be referencing a book or a journal article, but it's just okay to read Wikipedia. And after 15 years, I'm still having students in my college courses tell me that they don't read Wikipedia because their high school teacher told them it's not reliable. It's reliable. It is open access. Anyone can get there. So uh, to honor Wikipedia, here is a Wikipedia definition. Okay, now um, let me see. I'm still having trouble going around. Okay, carrying on. Um, can you still hear me? Sorry, I just clicked a button. Ariel, can you still hear yeah. me? Yeah, okay, we can hear you. I'm gonna carry on. Mm -hmm. So here we have now jumped, jumped. Thank you, Star Trek, for beaming us all over the world um, in like two seconds. We're in the Arctic regions of Canada. These are the Inuit regions. There are four of them in Northern Canada. So let's start in the West, just next door to Alaska, where there are many Inuit communities um, and First Nations communities, uh, Dene, Gwich'in. Um, and the orange bit of the slides is the Inuvialuit region. So Inuvik is um, the town that's at the center of gov government. Then to the east, we've got Nunavut. That's this yellow area and it's massive. And it's got the biggest islands in the world like uh, Baffin Island, Talarutit. Um, uh, part of it borders Hudson Bay to the west. Then going further to the east, we have northern, what well, used to be northern Quebec and is now Nunavik. And to the east of that, we have Nunatsiavut, which is uh, the northern part of the coast of Labrador. And all of these regions are self-governing. So they are not provinces, they are um, territories, but they are self-governing. Okay, um, which is, so that's like a state pretty much, right? So there are elected representatives. Um, and this part of Canada has very low population density. Most people who live in Canada live within 100 miles of the Canada-US border. Think about that. And the southernmost part of the province I'm in, Ontario, point uh, Pelee Island is on the same latitude as Northern California. So there's a lot to think about in terms of the geography. Then where it says Inuit regions, there's a pale um, mauve and that is Greenland, which is um, also an Inuit region. And um, it is actually seeking independence from Denmark. So yes. Um, we'll see what happens there. That will be interesting. Okay. And for some reason, sorry, for some reason, I'm getting some weird, I think I'm, I'm hitting the wrong buttons. I'm going to move myself around again. So you can see um, where we, where we are now, this is a map of the world um, with the major biomes. If it's salmon pink, you are in a desert. You can see deserts in the um, Southern and Western part of the USA. Mojave Desert, etc. Chihuahuan Desert, like cool places, really cool places um, with a lot of cactus. Um, North Africa, Sahara Desert, and then into deserts right through to the east, um, through Saudi Arabia, the, the, the peninsula, um, and then through the stands, and then through to Mongolia, China, the Gobi Desert, and then pop down to Australia. There are also deserts 
in uh, desert biomes in Africa, South Africa, and in uh, South America. Okay, but let's jump up to um, the purple, or I should say the gray bits, the gray, did I say purple? Hmm, I meant gray. <laughs> okay, so if you can see gray, we've got a light gray and a dark gray. The light gray here is um, tundra, with interfrost. So that means um, they've got some frozen ground substrate. Um, and there's a lot of it through Siberia. And then there's the light gray, and that is tundra with permafrost. It's permanently frozen soil. And then Greenland, um, whose Inuit name keeps going out of my head. I'll come back to that in a minute because we should call it by its Inuit name. Um, in fact, uh, we should prefer to do that, is got this big ice sheet. And that, if you know anything about global warming, that is melting. Um, and in fact, that is the source of, it's the most active iceberg carving place in the world. And the iceberg that the Titanic crashed into, that sank the Titanic, came from um, the west side of Greenland. So what you can see on this map, I've got three three arrows, three arrows to look at here. Um, one is that big, thick, uh, dark blue arrow going from east to west on the map, right? That is along the same latitude. Then I want you to look at Tromsø, which is Arctic Norway. So it's in a little bit of gray stuff. That's where that mountain was at the beginning, where Andrew was on an ice pack in July and there was still snow on the ground. And then I want you to look at this light brown series of arrows that is crossing from the Gulf of Mexico right up along the coast of Europe. So, so some things to notice on this map. The big thick arrow with um, pointers at either end, what you can see is in North America that gray, those gray biomes, the tundra regions, um, they actually are coming way further south in North America. Do you see that? Um, they're hitting that line. But when you go to Europe, let's look for the gray in Europe. It's all green. It's like light green. And when you look at the kind of um, on the left in the legend, what kind of biome is that? Ooh, it's temperate forest above that line, boreal, humid, um, temperate. It, it, these are forests with trees. You have to go all the way to Tromsø to find Arctic, Alpine, tundra type vegetation. But then when you get over into Siberia, Northern Russia, you see that that gray zone is coming further south. What is going on here? Well, what is going on is the Gulf Stream, this really important Atlantic Ocean current that is moving warm water from the Gulf of Mexico across to Northern Europe, and it's warming everything up. Unfortunately, a projection of global warming is that as we pump more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, we are going to interfere with these important ocean currents. And if the Gulf Stream gets switched off, Northern Europe, which is very mild in the winter, is going to be put in the same deep freeze as we are in. Scary, eh? Okay, so these are important things. Now, remember Tromsø. Remember where Tromsø is. Toronto is down here. I've got my arrow where Toronto is. I don't know if you can see it. Um, in the Great Lakes region. So we're well below that line. Trump says way above. Why do I have this here? Well, it's because of this. Gulf Stream, warming water. Um, this is the botanical garden in Tromsø. You can see trees. There's all these cute trees around. Oh, but it's tundra. No, it's actually like boreal forest. Um, it is located well above. Let's see if I can move this without doing something weird. Uh, Tromsø Botanical Garden is located well above what's called the Arctic Circle, but because of the warm water currents that are there, what it means is that the local the climate is modified enough to have trees and forest, um, and they can reach way further north than you can get trees and forest in Greenland and Canada. And it means that when I went to the Botanic Gardens, what did I find flowering there? I found the plant, the official flower of my province of Ontario, Carolinian forest, 
you know, Carolinas happily living and flowering in that botanic garden. Crazy. You could go to the same um, latitude in Canada. This will not survive there. It will like be frozen. It just can't survive. So you can see the moderation of these um, of, of these of these important ocean currents. They are they are moderating the um, the climate. Let's see if I can move this down and get to see me. OK, a little bit more. OK, so. Sorry, I just keep moving me around on the screen because I'm on a laptop. And when you actually look at the Arctic and Alpine flowers in the Botanic Gardens, here are these cute little cushion plants. Look at them. They're so cute. Saxifrages. You'll find them in your own rock garden. People grow them. Um, Dryas, um, Avon. So cute. Um, aren't they? They're adorable. They are uh, not trees, they are little bunchy, cushiony things, and they are called hemicryptophytes because their buds are right at the soil. They are protected by the scales on the plant and the dead leaves and the litter and the snow, and that is creating a warming environment, a microclimate. So these cushion plants are actually modifying their own micro um, environments. It's like putting on a down jacket to go outside in the winter, you're modifying, right? That's what they do. Uh, let's see if I can go, okay, here. So hemicryptophytes are these cute little cushion plants and if uh, they are the one of the dominant life plant life forms in the Arctic. There's also other kinds, oh, should be doing this. Um, Camiphytes on the bottom right, which are low lying. So these are sprawling plants. They're lying close to the ground to keep warm. And if the snow comes, they're gonna be underneath the snow. And if you look at the left, this is like my only uh, graph I'm showing you. We're looking at the percentage of total flora in the world that's different uh, appearances of plants. And this is from the Arctic. So if you look at the white bars, um, there's a really big, tall white bar that says nearly 50% of the appearances of plants in the world are what are called phanerophyte. That's a tree. Phanerophyte is a fancy schmancy name for a tree. Um, you can see that to the left of that in the Arctic, there's barely any tree forms. Because if they grow above the snowpack, that minus 40 Celsius is just going to shear off the top N nothing can survive in the winter so adapt or die <laughs> and so really there are no trees there there are a lot of um camiphytes these low-lying sprawling plants about 30 percent most plants in the arctic are 50 percent are hemicryptophytes there's full-on cryptophytes teeny 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 tiny plants and there's something called a therophyte as well um which isn't that common but you can see camiphyte hemicryptophyte cryptophyte the black bars are higher than the white bars, which is the average distribution in the entire world. Um, the Arctic is where these kind of plants are at. So what percentage of uh, Arctic type plants are outside? Well, you do actually find quite a few in alpine regions and in people's gardens because they're in your rock garden, they're kind of cute. They have tiny, beautiful flowers. So in the Arctic, uh, your microclimate, this is my friend, Lynn Moorman. Let me move myself over here. She is a geoscientist and in very bad pink type, it says, look at this incredibly warm microclimate for plants in these chert sedimentary rocks. She was trying to educate me about rocks and I was like, oh, that's nice. Look at this tiny, tiny, tiny flowering plant. Um, and I was getting excited about that. And she was getting excited about the rocks. But um, so these are these areas where things are protected. And you can see a shrub behind her, which is a sprawling willow bush. That's basically the tree of the Arctic. When you get really, really high north, this is this is classic desert, but it's Arctic polar desert. These are the graves of some of the, sol the sailors from the um, lost expedition of the Franklin expedition. These people were sent by the Royal Navy, Brit the British Royal Navy, to find the Northwest Passage, to try and find a shorter route to get through to Asia and China, to cut off the um, time for sailing ships to go around Cape Horn and the southern part of Africa. Like the Suez Canal didn't 
exist then. If you wanted to sail from England to India, you had to go a really long way around a whole bunch of uh, like South Africa, South America. So Panama Canal didn't exist. So they thought, oh, there's this thing you can get through, through the Arctic Northwest Passage. And these guys pretty much all died trying and they got stranded here on this place. And anyway, the ships have been rediscovered, have been discovered. Um, yeah, yeah, this is this whole saga. You can read about that. Anyway, so you can see on the top right, we've got these, um, I just made a montage of my favorite Arctic poppy photos. There are flowers in amongst these rocks. Um, there are avens, that's a rose family. There's little mouse or chickweeds, which is like um, a carnation family, tiny, tiny, tiny. And then there's a professional photographer. He isn't lying down, but he's got this massive lens and he's trying to, you know, take pictures. So it's a very desolate place and the Inuit do very, very well there. They have adapted. So uh, let me change again. Are there any questions that I should answer at this point, Ariel and Alex? Yeah, we had a couple of questions about the regions. So um, based on the regions, um, how does this affect the plant growth and size? Do they mean Arctic within an Arctic region? Yeah. So the further north you go, so as you get above the tree line, you're going to see more shrubs. Actually, you're going to see it right now. Oh, OK, I just showed you polar desert way north, Beachy Island way, 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 oh, you know, like much closer to the poles than we are, the North Pole. Now, if you look here, um, it says natural selection has shaped Arctic willow species. Does everyone know that a willow is a tree, weeping willow tree, right? So you can see the top right picture. That is a willow tree in my local park, really big weeping, weeping willows, right? Just beautiful, just beautiful in the fall. Um, underneath it, we've got yet somebody else lying on the ground to take a photograph. So you all, everyone gets that in the Arctic, take a yoga mat, you're going to lie on the ground to take a plant picture, right? You, 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 you got to really practice your yoga stretching to do this. Seriously, you'll do this. Now, that little bush that Dr. Martin Lunen is behind is a willow bush. So there is a lot of willow bushes. So before you completely get to polar desert, you will go through a zone where there are no trees, but there are like waist high willow bushes, right? And that's because they have a snowpack that is higher because when you get to really high Arctic um, polar desert in the north, the snowpack is pretty low. So basically if you're not protected by the snowpack in the winter, that's gonna determine the height of the vegetation. Does that make sense? Because anything above it is just, you're like, nah, you're not coming out the other, the other, the end of winter alive because your, your buds are going to be just killed with the cold. Now, this chap here that you can see, this is actually Tromsø in Northern Norway. His name is Raoul Amundsen and he's a really, really, really famous Arctic explorer. He got to the South Pole, brought his team back alive. He actually, I'm going to move this over so we can see what he's wearing. So Raoul Amundsen is shown here in Norway. He's a Norwegian dude. He actually lived in central um, Canadian Arctic for quite a while. And he is wearing in this statue, he is wearing um, polar bear fur trousers, pants. He's wearing traditional mukluks and he's wearing an Inuit parka. So when he went to the Arctic, he learned from the Inuit how to survive in these really crazy cold places. He adapted. He adapted his behavior. Plants can't adapt their behavior. They just have to, natural selection is happening. If you're too tall, you're not gonna survive and produce any seeds, right? So that's being adapted to the environmental condition. And that, my friends, is natural selection for evolution. So when we're up in this tundra, let's talk a little bit about what we're gonna experience if we get up there. Well, unlike our long summers here, it's a very short growing season. This is me 
about nearly 45 years ago. So I've been doing field work for like a really long time and I'm a lot slimmer here and my hair is black and I'm wearing these cool sunglasses that I think are back in fashion, <laughs> horror. Um, and we're coming to the end of the winter. We're coming into spring. I'm studying grasses that are eaten by snow geese and that snow on Hudson Bay, I'm on the west side of Hudson Bay. It's gonna start melting real fast. We have a camp on an island in a river delta and we're about to get flooded. So I am digging drainage tunnels so that the melt water can like flow away from this island. And when the snow melts, you don't see much vegetation because most of the plant growth is below ground. So that's something that Arctic plants do. Most of their resources are in their roots, okay? Let's see if we can just get go to the next one. And in this slide, you can actually see I'm way high in the Arctic, near Greece Fjord, way high in the high Arctic, not in the low Arctic. So the low Arctic is, is uh, the lower latitudes. So 61, 62, 63. The high Arctic is a higher number, 70, 80. So we talk about low Arctic being more lush, higher bi biodiversity, taller shrubs. Um, it's the low Arctic because it's a smaller number on the latitude scale. High Arctic is just a higher number and high Arctic is where the true polar desert is. But you can see I'm pulling, I'm pulling, um, I don't know whether you can see this, but there is um, like an, um, an ice rip where it's ripped away. Can you see all the roots? Most of the roots, most of the plant is below ground. You will see, if you walk around, you'll see one tiny willow twig. But that plant is like covering its root system is like 100 feet by 100 feet. It's supporting it. Okay. So that's what's going on there. Now, here's a little bit about me where I um, uh, have spent a lot of summers. Um, you can see in the, uh, so I was 19. How, how old are you guys? Are, are you like 16, 17? Uh, 17, 17, 18. So I was only a couple of years older than you when I started going up to do field work. You can start planning right now. So you can see Toronto on this map. And I was like, um, you can go up to Churchill, which is in Manitoba, it's a province, it's not in the Arctic, but it's got this coastal cold strip. So tundra comes south and you can see on the big map of the Inuit regions, I'm just south of what is now known of it today. And this is where I'm doing field work. All that brown stuff on the ground where there's a girl kneeling down to sample grass, that is gonna turn, that's like dead grass, the roots, it's the, the, the snow has melted, it's gonna get hot, this is end of May, it's gonna turn around real fast, like real fast. So here you can see the camp is on a river, an island in the river. Here's me, yes, I'm carrying a gun, yes, I'm carrying a rifle. Why am I carrying a rifle? Because there's polar bears. And uh, we have to be scanning for them all the time. And um, underneath um, us is polar bear vandalism. That is done by polar bears looking for my muffins. So when I started this cat, there was a lot of polar bear activity. I stayed into the fall because I was studying plants. Everybody else was studying geese. The snow geese were migrating by early August, but by September, October is when the polar bears come to meet the ice and go out on the ice in church. Also a lot of bears. Anyway, um, it was a thing. Now that whole camp is surrounded by um, an electric fence after, after me and the polar bears had a lot of face-to-face -face chats. Um, I was safe. They were safe. There was no mortality. Okay. So you're up in the Arctic and you're like, oh, it, it just melted. It's going to get real cold again by September. What's going to happen here? Well, what's going to happen is photosynthesis, long days. The days, the sun is barely setting. We're at a very high latitude. Um, it's long, long, long days. And I love this quote that what drives life on earth is a little current kept up by the sunshine. And you can see bottom left, this, this sun, that is a tiny plant. Everything goes into overdrive photosynthesis like 18 hours a day, it's just crazy. And you do know that, um, I'll put this down here, leaves are like little factories there. They're producing sugar, starch, proteins, amino acids, nucleic acids. 
crazy stuff is going and it's happening real really it's it, it, it's it's the whole the whole tundra is photosynthesizing then when you get into fall we know that chlorophyll is green but that there's a lot of other helper um photosynthetic pigments and there's a lot of that in in the arctic you you start to see fall really soon um so this picture here is snow has melted it's melting um the grass starts growing. The snow geese are so hungry that are nesting there. They can't wait for that grass to eat it. They're like literally digging up the mud and eating the roots because the roots is where the nutrients are. And they destroyed loads of tundra by doing that. They just need food, right? Um, are there any other questions that I should ask? Because we're going to get on. I'm going to try and finish up real soon. Yeah. So going back to talking about the roots and the soil, a question by John Devine was, what nutrients are in Arctic soil? Is agriculture at all possible? Question, is agriculture at all possible? And the short answer is not really no because um, of the permafrost. But that doesn't mean it hasn't been tried in, in the Northwest Territories. <laughs> um uh, in the 1950s, Agriculture Canada, this is where there is more boreal, so taller trees, deeper soils, not uh, just south of the tundra. They actually set up some research stations for agriculture, bringing in a lot of plants from Siberia, which some of which became invasive species, Siberian bee, which is super invasive in Alaska and in Canada. It was tried. It didn't really work. OK, OK. So the geese are destroying the roots um, very quickly. In six weeks, the entire tundra is blooming. See these beautiful willow bushes, those purple flowers. That's um, that's a form of paintbrush, Castellasia, which is there's a sister species in the United States. Yellow, Potentilla, it looks like little buttercups. And then, oh, it's just flowers everywhere. It's just crazy. And then it starts to get longer days. You get Aurora Borealis. Everything is happening in like six to eight weeks. It's like super fast. And you can see that the leaves on these blueberry bushes, they're in the shade. This is now we are in Greenland. We're in Alulasat where all the icebergs are coming from the East Fjord. And you can see the leaves have started to turn red already. So we, we're, going, we're going into fall. That is the end of August, like eight weeks. That's it, boom, everything happened super fast, has to. And you can see this is in September in Nunatsiavut. We've got snow on the ground and full colors are coming in from these um, low-lying shrubs, which are willow species, actually, actually. So if you're a plant, do you really have time to be pollinated? Yes, there are bees in the Arctic. There, there are bees, there are bees. I have seen them and they kind of buzz around um, for, they are there. But for a plant, you can't wait for pollination. So generally most species do other things. They are perennials. They do this cool thing called vivipary, where the seed actually germinates in the mother plant and will drop off as a seedling. Um, they are wind dispersed. We don't have time for animals to disperse seeds. And bottom right, cold's foot, um, a lot of the flowers don't need pollinators. They are clones of the mother plant. They will just set seed and blow around. They don't, they don't need to be pollinated. So yeah, you, you just, it, time, time is of the essence. And likewise here. So climate change is making longer growing seasons. And you might think, oh, isn't that a good thing? And the answer is not really, because the Inuit's lifestyle has adapted to be out on the ice in winter. Like they're hunting seals, they're hunting, like it really is a winter adapted, ice adapted culture. And when the ice is melting, it, makes things very dangerous and uh, it is very problematic. So this is a really old map from the National Arbor Day Foundation in the United States, 2006. That's nearly 20 years ago. And at that time, because of global warming, which is caused by humans and is not debatable, they had already changed the gardening zones. There are plants that we can now grow in my backyard in Toronto that 30 years ago, it was too cold for them to survive. And you may think, wow, I really want to grow bananas in my garden. But um, you have to think in these ecosystems, all the animals and plants are synchronized to the season and the biome. And when you start to push things out of whack, it becomes a problem for culture and pollinators. So in the United States, for, since 20 years, significant portions of many states shifted at least one full hardiness zone. That means it's warmer, you can grow more tropical plants. 
like Florida. And Florida's got all these invasive species coming in, but we won't worry about that. I do want to get to the end here. Feel like um, too much to say. So if you're going to the Arctic, and I hope that many of you will get there, how do you know what's there? Well, you're going to pick up a guide. We got loads of great guides. It's a great place to learn to do plant identification. Um, there's not that many species. So there's a biodiversity gradient. There's not just a latitudinal gradient in these biomes. There's way fewer species. There'll be thousands in tropical rainforest. Um, but in the Arctic, there's just not that many. It is, there are limitations. This is, a, this is a very harsh environment. Here's some books that you could use, Common Plants of Nunavut, Wildflowers of Greenland. Um, this is what it looks like. There's a range map. It'll tell you where you can find them. I'm covering up my data. So Greenland, for example, has about 500 native species and very few um, non-indigenous, non-native species. There's not that many invasive species because the cold kills them, uh, which is for now protecting it. Uh, the plants have Latin names. Um, so you can have like some boring flora with very technical. You can have a field guide. I like to match up the picture myself. I do know how to key them out, but, and then there's lots of local plant lists. Um, there are ferns in the Arctic. There are mosses in the Arctic. There are lichens, which are symbiotic um, organisms with a fungus um, and a photosynthetic algae. Um, recent DNA sequencing shows that these lichens, um, the orange and the gray, and uh, they're much more complex than we thought. Here's more lichens. Some look like dead wood. Um, what else do we have here? Other, um, there's algae, again, to the right, desert. Okay, let's just quickly, because I want to wind up and do questions. Plants are really important to the Inuit. Um, ethnobotany is about how um, the plants are used. The Inuvialuit Nuchiangit uh, is a book that was written by elders with um, an ethnobotanist. There's a lot of collaborations now documenting this knowledge before it is lost from elders because it's really an oral tradition. So there was a real rush to write things down. And Inuit will use plants. Um, these, are, these, are, these are what all they're using it for, but including medicine, material, technology, and they just love them because they're beautiful wildflowers. And this is a friend of mine in her traditional Inuit uh, clothing. Um, what else? Well, during a cold winter night, um, in an ice house, how do you keep warm and cook your food? Well, you, the traditional way was to use the kudlik, which is a soapstone oil lamp. You can see a lady here in one of the communities that I visited, and she's got Crisco oil in there or olive oil, but it would have been seal blubber. But the wick that keeps the flame going is coming from plants, cotton grass, and willow, these kind of floaty Q-tip looking things. Um, and it, in the summer, a lot of that would have to be harvested to keep that kudlik, which is gonna light your ice house or igloo. It's gonna light, it's gonna keep it warm and it's gonna cook your food. Um, there are important grasses in the Arctic, which are used to do basket weaving because there are no willow bushes to make baskets. So how do you do it? You're gonna weave it from the grass, amazing. Arctic willow um, is ukpi suputilu. Suputit is the fluffy seeds. Ukpi is the woody stem. Really important, can be used as a um, as a fuel. And also, ha ha, aspirin. Aspirin. It comes from willow. So you can chew a leaf, deal with your headache. Okay, other forms of traditional Arctic food are from the sea. So seals are really important, seal skins um, and whales. And you can see this whole spread uh, prepared by another colleague who is also a filmmaker. She's actually a very famous um, personality from, um, from, from Nunavut, um, Ayupita. And she's got this whole spread of everything from Arctic char, which is like salmon. And it's, it's all raw, it's all raw. Loads of berries in the Arctic as well. Um, blueberries are really, really important. Um, loads of crowberries, and they're very bitter and they're high in vitamin C. Um, my favorite, cloudberry, which is like a relative of a strawberry. Each plant produces one berry. You have to be really careful with this one. Grows in a bog. 
Cloud berries are all around the Arctic. And here is a beautiful um, embroidery from Sweden. Um, this stuff called Hunglit, a mountain sorrel, tastes like lemons, it's super yummy. Dual fireweed, this is the national flower of Greenland. Um, every part is edible, it's yummy. Um, seaside bluebells, more, like it's, it, th th there's a lot of food out there. There's a lot of food out, it's really small, there's a lot of food. This is um, a really cool book um, that was written by Alice Jomi, who is an Inuit elder, where she's like introducing, it's a kid's book, it's for young people, and it was updated and it's absolutely fantastic. Okay, so I am going to end there and stop the share. And we've got very few minutes for questions. So Arctic plants and people, they're there in the Arctic, they're tiny, they're important, and it's being affected by climate change. Go ahead, what questions do we have? Let me look at Q&A. Okay, looking at questions. Um, okay, taking it from the bottom. How many times have I visited the Arctic, mate? I I can't even count. I don't know. Um, I go a lot as a public science botanist with Adventure Canada a lot. And I have been in the former Soviet Union, Russian Arctic. I've spent a lot of time doing fieldwork in Sweden, Arctic, Norway, Iceland, Greenland, right across the Canadian Arctic. I hope that answers the question. Um, so I answered that one. Um, how many books do I have in my library? Oh, this is a family library. I purged it because books collect dust and it makes everybody sneeze. I actually try to not buy too many books. I read books on Kindle and my e-reader, but look at this awesome book I just got. Deserts, Hot Deserts, The Cactus Hunters by a professor at the University of Alabama. It's the illegal trade in cactus. Who knew? I just went to his talk. Um, genus, genus, Kenyan woods. So the willow that's in the park, same willow. Yeah, the G yeah, yes, absolutely. Salix, Salix, S-A-L-I-X. Yes, that's the genus. Um, yes, yes, yes. It, they've adapted. <laughs> what animals are around to eat these plants? Do the plants have, diff oh, Oh, that's another whole topic. You got to come next year. I'll do plant defenses. They don't have defenses. Generally, um, a lot of grazing animals, lemmings, um, people, uh, caribou. <laughs> They're eating the plants. The plants generally don't have defenses because if you're surviving in the Arctic, you're just putting all your resources into surviving. Um, right. Animals. So why are you researching this topic? Short answer, because when 43 years ago, I love plants. I was offered to do a master's in a tropical rainforest in Belize. And I was like, oh no, oh no. Because in the Arctic, there's only 500 species. You can learn to identify the species. Like when I go out through my window into Southern Ontario, the Carolinian forest, I've done decades of work on forest management. I still don't know most of what I'm looking at. Like I can, I can put it in a family. There's just, the biodiversity is too high. So short answer, I can cope with the biodiversity. Um, that's it. Can Arctic plants get cancer? Depends what you mean by cancer. If you mean like have little pulpy things growing on them, little growths and tumory looking things, yeah. Uh, but it's not the same as our cancer. Uh, in humans. Are the cells in plants different depending on their distance from the equator? Yes. Um, they're the same. They're the same, but they're just um have they'll be they'll be different. Yes. Yes. Yeah. They'll be the biochemistry is different. Do animals eat any of the yes, totally. Um, because geese, geese, Canada geese, snow geese. What do plants need to survive in the Arctic? Same as anything else. Sun, water, oxygen, nutrients. Yeah. Um, running out, how do the plants survive is suspended. I think I covered that. So they get selected and they have adapted adapted features. I think um done. Am I done? <laughs> Did I answer all the questions? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any questions? No. No, that that was no, just no. the QA questions. 
Lovely. Well, thank you so much for hosting me again. Um, I'm excited to watch some of the other talk students in my applied plant ecology course. My It's like a senior year college course. They'll be signing into other ones. I told them, don't come to mine. I said, you can just watch me on the internet. You listen to me three times a week. You don't need to. Yeah. Okay. Take care, everybody. Are we are we going right. to sign off? Is there anything else I need, we need to chat? Um, uh, thank you for this wonder wonderful presentation. Thank uh, you. Have a great weekend. Yeah. Oh, you. Well, Christy you. Davis raised her hand. Somebody raised their hand. We got to. Just not laughing. We have two okay. more questions. One more question. It said, um, Crystal Davis asked, how did you start this work at 19? Good question. I started college quite young because um, I emigrated to Canada. I did how many years? Three years of high school, maybe, um, from England. I was born in India, emigrated from India to England, then India. And because of the British system, I got put up two grades. So I went to university. My parents and everybody thought I was going to be a medical doctor, hate the sight of blood, love plants. And literally in my third year, my professor said, we have a position for a field assistant. Do you want to come and be a field assistant for a young woman who is studying the grasses grazed by snow geese? Um, her name is Sue Cargill. She went on to Alaska for a PhD. And that was the beginning. And I went up for five summers and I never really looked back. I did go to study grass eaten by sheep. So I'm really a grass biologist. And I left doing fieldwork in the Arctic in 1984. I did five summers on Hudson Bay. It took me 20 years to get back to the Arctic. So what was the other question? Um, and I always wanted to get back to the Arctic because yeah. I just love the Arctic because cool. I know the plant species. <laughs> what was the other question? question? It was just the same question repeated again. It was the same question. Right, there you are. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Yeah. So I was offered a chance, my mother, okay, this is really important students. Don't tell your mother that you have to be trained to carry a gun because there's polar bears. She never knew until quite recently. <laughs> Don't tell your mother. <laughs> okay, just go, just go. <laughs> Thank you for this wonderful, Bye. thank you for this wonderful presentation. It was nice to have you. Thank yeah. you. Um, this concludes our fourth webinar. We hope you enjoyed it. Uh, our next webinar will be with Peggy and Pam.